Hello, and thanks, Joe, for asking me to do a little talk for her fantastic PMLD conference um, about the Lives Live Well surveys of uh, practitioners and others involved in the teaching of young people with profound and multiple learning difficulties. Uh, the Lives Live Well surveys um, became the book Julie and I uh, wrote. Um, which was published a year or so ago now, uh, called Enhancing Wellbeing and Independence for Young People with Profound and Multiple Learning Difficulties, Lives Lived Well. And that was the title of the survey. And so I don't want to do a hard sell on the book because it's been out for over a year. Uh, but I do want to just report some of the findings of the surveys because uh, I, I suspect that many of you contributed them, filled in the questionnaire, uh, and uh, so this is kind of feedback in a way. Um, so anyway, just a bit of background. Um, again, some of you will know this. Um, the whole project which led to the surveys, which then led to the book, I suppose started in November 2018 um, as part of uh, one of Flo Longhorn's conferences at Swiss Cottage School in London. Um, and I've given me, I've been given the opportunity um, of carrying out some research with Cambridge University uh, Faculty of Education. I wasn't quite sure exactly what I wanted to research, uh, what I wanted the research to be about um, within, you know, profound multiple learning difficulties. Uh, so I simply asked the 80 or so delegates at that conference, and some of you may have been there, uh, to write down what they thought the most burning issues facing the education of young people with PMLD were today. And all the things that came out of those incredibly useful responses, um, it was clear that there were real concerns out there about um, uh, well-being um, of these young people, the well-being of these young people, the extent they're able to participate in their communities, large and small, and more broadly about what independence means uh, for them and for those who care for them. And another sort of sub theme came out, which I'm sure will interest some of you. Uh, and that was summed up by one head teacher who said she was worried that the special educational needs and disabilities code of practice, which has been statutory guidance since 2014, whilst appearing to cover young people with PMLD, didn't actually cater for them. So anyway, this became a theme of the research. So, so I created a questionnaire initially to send out to UK schools. Um, and, uh, you know, those of you who have seen it, uh, you know, there was 26 questions, too many, a few questions about the school and the setting, and then questions about well-being, really about how student and schools support well-being. Similar questions about independence, uh, questions about parents and carers and how they're involved. Questions about community participation. And finally, this key, key question, which we'll come back to in a minute. To what extent do you feel the STEM code of practice takes account of the needs of learners with PMLD? Now, the, the, that questionnaire was actually really focused on learners aged between 14 and 19, because that was the age group I taught and worked with um, when I was uh, working in schools, special schools in Essex and Cambridgeshire. Anyway, I got 52 replies from, uh, the, I think, 210 schools uh, who are authorised in the UK to teach young people with PMLV age 14 to 18. I thought that was quite a good percentage, really, you know, 25 percent. Um, and there was teachers and head teachers mainly. Uh, and then I also asked to ask some of the survey participants uh, who were, otherwise were anonymous if uh, if they wanted to join an online focus group to follow up on some of the questions and some of the issues raised in the questionnaires. Um, having done that for a UK audience, I then kind of redesigned the questionnaire for an international audience. Um, I redesigned it because it was too long and there were some questions which we didn't think were appropriate or relevant anymore. Uh, you know, there are a few my, my, my minor differences. Um, and then I sent out the international questionnaire, which is also in the back of this book, um, 
to, uh, to contacts around the world um, and contacts of contacts, um, uh, which is kind of known, as you, some of you will know, is known, is known as snowball or convenience and convenience sampling. So we didn't really have much control about where it went, uh, but it kind of went around the world using the magic of the internet. Um, and we got another 65 replies from practitioners, teachers, parents in 19 different countries from around the world. And I'm going to uh, just read the list of those countries. Um, so we had 15 from Spain, a lot from Spain, 14 from Singapore, seven from India, seven from Israel, five from Thailand, three from the US, two from Australia, two from Finland. And one each from Cyprus, France, Greece, Hungary, Ireland, Kenya, Macedonia, Norway, Slovakia, Taiwan and uh, Timor-Leste. And you know, we had a lot of help. Um, uh, somebody in Spain translated the questionnaire into Spanish then translated the answers back again. Um, and, and so the... Uh, but of course, it's important to say, sorry, at this point, that whilst the English questionnaire, we were able to target schools in particular in England who teach young people with PMLD, um, uh, the international questionnaire was uh, not so targeted. So we did have some parents, some teachers, some physiotherapists, psychologists, uh, a broader range of stakeholders in the lives of people with PMLD. Um, uh, so... Um, let me just uh, present to you now some of that data, just a little bit, um, in the UK international surveys. Some of the data was quantitative, made up of numbers, and some of it was qualitative, people's voices, the voices of nearly 120 practitioners, teachers, parents, sport workers from, uh, from around the world. Okay. Um, so what do those people say? Well, uh, a lot. We had kind of 19,000 words of data, I think, and it takes up the largest part of the book, part two of the book. Um, but here are some of the themes which emerged. Uh, ways teachers and other practitioners actually get, it, get to know each young person. Some very interesting comments from around the world. The differences and overlaps between physical well-being and emotional well-being for this group. Because although for the purpose of the questionnaire we sort of separated fish, physical and emotional well-being, uh, clearly they complement each other, they overlap. Um, uh, the, the participation or not in school communities and the wider communities beyond school of young people with PMLD. And, you know, I think this, this threw up one of the more interesting and actually shocking statistics. Um, I'm just going to read something here. Um, um, despite the efforts made by schools to involve their pupils with PMLD in the local community in one way or another, the UK survey found that nearly 70% of pupils with PMLD participate in the community less than their peers, their peers, that is to say, with mild, moderate, severe learning difficulties. And when a similar question was asked in the international survey, we get more or less the same picture. OK, other themes that came up, ways these young people express independence, obviously, sometimes in very unconventional, and idiosyncratic ways, but independence nonetheless, and how schools support them to do this. Uh, the ways they express choice. And in fact, what does choice mean? Is choice even an appropriate word? Um, uh, many people suggested that the word impact um, is a better word than choice. Impacting on the world around them. Um, uh, what physical independence means when somebody is profoundly disabled and dependent on other people for aspects of their care and well-being. Um, and what physical independence means when others, when they rely on others for personal and intimate care. We talked about, uh, we got a lot of information about what people think life skills are for this group. 
what are the skills that young people with PMLD really need? This important issue of voice, uh, the voices of the young people, the voices of their parents, their carers voices, their proxy voices. And in fact, as we ask in the book, whose voice is it anyway? And then again, another thing that comes up that came up in the questionnaires and is reflected in the book is who cares for the parents and carers? So, um, uh, if I can just um, quote briefly again here from from the questionnaire, um, uh, the staff are key to supporting pupils to achieve. Um, the third element of a definition of well-being, which we suggest in the book, which is being happy. Because one respondent put it, allowing staff to spend time discovering what maples, makes pupils happy upholds their well-being. And then in, in again here, well, I think one of the most memorable phrases that came up from all the 120 or so questionnaires, uh, a teacher in Spain summarised this with the phrase, the pedagogy of affection uh, which I think um, is an appropriate term and quite a neat phrase I think when you consider not only the meaning of affection as liking and bothering enough about someone someone's well-being to be nice to them but also in the psychological domain meaning anything to do with emotions of course uh, you know not all the there, there was a lot of really really interesting and uh, wonderful practice clearly going on around the world with young people with profound and multiple learning difficulties. But, uh, you know, uh, it's not all wonderful out there. Uh, there are problems and barriers and a few real shocks identified through the surveys. Um, we try to treat them sensibly and diplomatically, although, you know, sometimes we don't mention the name of the country. But there are two big issues that come up, which I'm sure many of you here will recognise. Um, which adversely affect young people with PMLD around the world. Um, and I'll just briefly mention each. But we do, of course, discuss, uh, you know, like all these issues are discussed in greater detail in the book. So the first big issue that came up is what happens when these young people leave school, um, which they do at various ages between 15 and 21 around the world. Well, again, in most countries, schools do a fantastic job preparing their young pe their, 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 their pupils and their families for that key moment. But after that, you know, there's a lot of bad vibes and bad news out there about what happens next. In the UK, and more or less ev everywhere else in the world, uh, as one teacher put it, puts it uh, starkly, let me just find this. Um, and this is, again, one of those things that came up in the surveys which really struck home. It is my belief that our students will never have such enriched lives again after leaving us. OK, um, right. And also um, the other key issue that came up in the surveys was the inadequacy of public policy all the way around the world, not just in the UK. And this sort of returns to what that head teacher said at Flow Longhorns 2018 conference, uh, that policies perhaps do not cater for young people with PMLD. And um, a teacher from the UK puts it uh, like this. Um, These learners needs are wide ranging and complicated. And the SEN code of practice does not take account of that. Another teacher from the UK, I think the complexity of the needs of these learners is not necessarily recognised in the SEND code of practice. It is our job to adapt it to be suitable for them. And another one, I think it neglects to accept the complexities of this cohort. And this is an issue round the world and in fact is in a way a starker issue round the world. Um, and this is what some of our colleagues, practitioners, parents, carers, teachers say, we are always the forgotten ones. We being the young people with profound multiple learning difficulties, their parents, carers. In my country, disability is not taken into account in education. To be honest, no one outside of what is called normal is taken into account. 
the young people with PMLD are not taken into consideration in the policies. The tendency is overprotecting as a way of freeing the state of responsibilities. And they consider in my country that being cared for and fed is enough. Uh, educational policies in my country are obsolete in relation to other countries. Um, legislative regulation for special education hasn't been renewed since the 1980s. And legislation has been made up using patches and inventing concepts that do not take into account the individual reality of people with PMLD. Okay, so, uh, you know, that is what came up in the Lives Live Well survey and what we present in the book. If, if there is a message from all the survey responses, I think it, it can be said that, we, you know, we can all learn from these practitioners that being human is not just some kind of glamorized and media driven notion of independence, well being, community, the kind of definitions of well being, independence, and community which we're presented with by the media every day. Um, that is to say, a job, a family, a house, this sort of thing. When we come to talking about people with profound multiple learning disabilities, of which there are possibly as many as 70,000 just in the UK, uh, we have to think about those terms in different ways. And so perhaps we'd all benefit from rethinking those uh, terms. Okay, so those are just a few of the results of the Lives Did Well survey. Uh, you know, uh, I hope you will, from the library or whatever, read the book. Uh, enhancing well-being and independence for young people with profound and multiple learning disabilities lives live well, um, which was co-authored with the uh, extraordinary Julie Tilbury from Chelly Heritage School. Well, I hope that's given you some insight into practice with young people with profound and multiple difficulties around the world. And thanks again to Joe for inviting me to contribute.